Welcome to all of you for this small talk between two eminent personalities, Bas Smet and Manfred Selling, both from a different world. Um, Bas Smet is a landschapsarchitect die ondertussen wel al enige naam en faam heeft in, in, in België, maar ook internationaal op de kaart staat. En uh, voor diegenen die het nog niet zouden opgemerkt hebben, aan de ingang van het paleis, de weg naar het... Uh, Naar het Warandepark is er nu een Horta Horizon installatie gemaakt, ook door um, pas met Manfred Selink, is directeur van, het Koner, van de Koninklijke Musea in Antwerpen voor schone kunsten en was ook de curator, mede curator van de Breugel tentoonstelling in Wenen. En daar komen we natuurlijk meteen tot het onderwerp van vanavond, want 450 jaar Breugel, daar ontsnappen we niet aan in 2019. En ook dit gesprek heeft plaats uh, in, die, in die context. Um, Bas en ik zijn eigenlijk elkaar tegen het lijf gelopen in Wenen in de tentoonstelling over Breugel, waar Bas plots begon te vertellen uh, over zijn project, een onderzoeksproject dat hij aan het doen was. Want Breugel, uh, c'était une analyse, que, une recherche que Bas était en train de faire sur la peinture de Breugel, et plus en particulier, il étudiait, il faisait une, une analyse très profonde sur les arbres et les, les, les végétaux dans les peintures de Breugel, mais en même temps, il faisait aussi sa propre interprétation, et il a créé des nouvelles œuvres qui, avec une, une poésie très personnelle qui, qui, qui a mis dedans, et c'est ce résultat qu'on qu peut voir en ce moment dans le Olorta, à Beaux-Arts, dans le contexte d'exposition euh, autour des... Des estampes au temps de Breugel. Dus diegenen die dit tentoonstelling nog niet zouden gezien hebben, gaan er alsjeblieft naartoe, want er is een hele wereld die voor jullie open gaat. Um, ik denk dat dit vanavond een vrij uniek gesprek gaat worden, waar dat het landschap gaat bekeken worden vanuit verschillende aspecten. Um, ik denk dat het ook een zeer interessant gesprek wordt, want de landschapsarchitectuur, je moet mij corrigeren pas, maar ik denk dat dat een vrij recent een beroep is als je het vergelijkt met het landschap in de schilderkunst. Um, en ik denk dat jullie daar heel veel over um, gaan vertellen vanavond, over die relatie, de perceptie van het landschap, um, hoe dat zich dat voordoet in de landschapsarchitectuur, maar vooral denk ik de geschiedenis in de schilderkunst. En ook nog, het is, is dat project een verdere zetting van de tentoonstelling van intussen twee, drie jaar geleden, in de context van de Biennale van het Landschap, waar Bas curator was van een heel merk, merkwaardig project, de uitvinding van het Landschap. Ik denk dat al die dingen bij elkaar uh, de aanleiding zijn uh, waarom dat wij hier vanavond met Manfred Selink en Bas Smit um, in de context van het Breugeljaar dit gesprek gaan beginnen. Zo. And dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, and understood the language will be English. Um, I do apologize that uh, we don't speak French and Dutch alternately as fluently as Sophie does, but still. Um, for me, it was a, a great honor and a, and, and a challenge to uh, have this conversation with Bas. Uh, uh, we had a pre-discussion on Friday, and this was very informative for me, surprising, and. Uh, I hope that we can share some insights and some ideas and about landscape in general. Um, I would like to start with five to ten minutes. I will not give a lecture on Peter Breugel, uh, but I will inform you, tell you something about Peter Breugel as a uh, landscape artist, um, and then give the floor to, to Bas, and then we'll see where we will end and start and end our discussion. So here you see Peter Breugel, uh, born somewhere around 1527-1528. He died in Brussels in 1569. Now for the general public, especially in, in Flanders and in Belgium, um, Breugel has this reputation of being the peasant Breugel, the boer Breugel, that's the image, the perception of Breugel that is really only to be found here in the southern Netherlands, here in Belgium. Um, since the, the beginning of the 20th century. But actually, if you look at the oeuvre of Breugel, and that's why we are here and we're taking Breugel as a point of departure, looking to the, the genesis of, of landscape art, Breugel was profoundly something else. Uh, you must situate him in, in the cities, in Antwerp and Brussels, in the first place, not as a 
doesn't burn hole. As you see him in the rhetoricians and humanists here. But you see, first of all see him as a landscape artist. That's how he, he was perceived by his contemporaries, that he had built up his fame. The, the landscape is really the fil rouge throughout his entire career. So here you see, for instance, say, and, and, and I will tell you something very briefly, uh, because this, this touches upon on Bass's work and his insight in, 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 in the landscape and how landscapes are built up and how landscapes can be perceived. Uh, Bruegel is extremely important in shaping the landscape, the landscape as a work of art, as a painting, as a print, as a drawing, as we perceive it now. And this is in the tradition of what is called the Wereldlandschaft, Weltlandschaft, it's called an art historical uh, uh, terminology and the Weltlandschaft is, panor is a broad panoramic landscape, not, and it is very important if you look into the landscapes of the 15th, 16th and 17th century, they're not realistic landscape, those are hybrid landscapes which are built up of all elements which you will find in nature. The landscape was perceived in the 15th and 16th century, landscape painting, and, and, and the landscape that was depicted either on panel or on paper was perceived as, as a recreation of paradise, so, so the earthly paradise, uh, which was perceived and which was depicted on a, pay, on a panel, on a canvas, or on a, a sheet of paper. And Bruegel um, is not the first landscape artist. Uh, in the 15th century, you'll find many artists using the landscape in the background, so becoming more important than the landscape starts. And the first landscape painter was Joachim Patenier. Uh, around 1520 in Antwerp. And here you see the typical landscape that Bruegel made. It's a scenic landscape built up in plains. Very important if you look at Bruegel, if you look at the landscape in the 16th century, is that it's, it's built up in plains in the foreground, middle ground, and the background. And that Bruegel has a pictorial strategy in leading your eyes. Very briefly, if you look at this painting, if you look at his drawings, his drawing, he probably made shortly after his return from Italy in 1554. There you see a landscape from a high point of view, not the highest point of view, because you still have to go up the hill a little to go down into the valley. And there you have the foreground of what we call in art historical terms a repoussoir. Repoussoir is something in the foreground, which gives definite something which is very interesting because Bas uses the repoussoir in his work without knowing the term, but using the same pictorial strategy in his, his landscapes designs. So they have the repoussoir, there's the trees to the left, giving depth to the background. With Bruegel and with the figure seen from the back, you go into the valley, you go into the middle plain, and then there is a river which leads your eye. That's very important. But Bruegel is a kind of filmmaker. He leads your eye, sets the stage, and leads your eye into the composition, taking you into the landscape. And then he leads your eye and leads you, following the river in the background, to, uh, into the background. And you see this, this is very briefly uh, said, you see this in the prints with Bruegel, was his fame doesn't rest on his paintings, yes, nowadays. But in his own time, the prints which were made after his drawings, that really made him famous, and that is what characterizes him for his contemporaries as the most important painter, most important artist of his generation of the 16th century. So here you see it again, uh, the tr monumental tree in the background, giving in the foreground, standing on the highest point of the hill, giving depth to the background. You can see it here as well. And this is really what a what, world landscape, a Weltlandschaft, is about depicting everything that you will find, taking scenes, taking landscapes which you could find in the southern Netherlands, which you could find in Italy, which you could find in the south of France, using all those elements and combining them in a depiction of everything that nature has to offer as a recreation of uh, paradise. And you see this not only uh, in the drawings, but then in his later paintings. Here you see what we call the repoussoir, very cleverly done. Uh, this is a painting from Budapest. There you see the landscape in the back, and you look with Bruegel and with the people seen on the back, you really look into the landscape. Very important in the pictorial strategy of Bruegel is that he positions you 
as an onlooker, as a part of the scene, making you look, making you wander into the landscape which he depicts. And you can see it, of course, here, uh, one of the most refined landscapes uh, you will ever find in the 16th and 17th century, of course, the, the return of the hunters from, from Vienna. And there you find this rhythmic placed trees, strategically placed, not only as very poussoirs, but leading your eye and leading the figures down the hill into the splendid background, uh, landscape in the background. So here, the, on the other famous painting from the cycle of the seasons or month, we can discuss about that, but that's not important in this respect. The landscape, great landscape from the Metropolitan Museum in New York, where the tree gives depth to the background in on one hand, the scenic landscape with a, a, a village to the right, and an open landscape again with the path leading your eye through the fields, leading towards a river in the background, leading your eye towards uh, the horizon, towards the, the cities in the background and the seas further away. So that is what Bruegel as a landscape is about, his enormous pictorial intelligence, his landscape being built up uh, in planes, uh, leading the eye and, and positioning the, the, the onlooker, the viewer, uh, actually as a part of the landscape. And Bas now would like to give the microphone to you. Uh, thank you tremendously for this um, brief, um, not introduction, but clarification on the composition of, of Bruegel. I'm very happy that you accepted my um, invitation to have this talk. Um, very honored that we can use Bruegel as a, a starting point. And to, to complement um, this discussion, I, I will try to give some insight in how we work in the office. I will show projects that we've done with the office. Most of the people from the office are, are here, so it's also their work. Um, but it, it, it might show how we use not only paintings, but also um, logics of nature as a starting point in, in our projects. And then we can discuss this freely. But so I, I chose a number of projects and their initial reference. And, and for example, this is the Turkish steppes in Sicily, um, which I visited a couple of years ago. And I was really um, touched by how erosion uh, waves um, created this kind of stepped landscape. And, and when we were asked to make a, 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 a sea resort in Lebanon, um, we used this reference um, to make this project. And, and in a way, of course, in a more rationalized way, we try to um, create steps between the, 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 the higher uh, part of the road towards the, the lower part of the Mediterranean. Within those steps, we integrated a, a pool, as you can see. But so the, 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 the initial reference was always in our minds, and we try to imitate not the image of nature, but the logic that produced the image. That's always central in, in our work. This would also be true for a recent project in La Défense, in, in Paris, where, where we were a bit um, struggling with what kind of landscape do you make in between skyscrapers where there's too much wind, where it's very um, cold and harsh, and, 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 and in a way the kind of glass skyscrapers made me think of the, the icy peaks of the Mont Blanc, as you can see here. And looking at this image, we were um, struck by this tree line. You know, the, there's a line where there's no more trees above, um, and, and also, the more you go down, you have these avalanches of stones that produces something looking like staircases. So we said, basically, if you look at La Défense, it is snowy peaks, it's a tree line, and it's avalanches of stones. And we used that mental image um, to, uh, to design the project that is now under construction. You can see the avalanches of stones flowing down to the, the, the level of the street. And here on this level, we, we will make a new tree line um, that will, in a way, for us at least, be an, 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 a, a reproduction of the logics of uh, a mountain scenery. From um, inspiration of, of, of natural uh, elements to inspiration from paintings, so everybody knows this one, the Empire of Light of Magritte, um, and this image came into my mind when we were asked to do the landscaping around um, a house that very much looks like this house, uh, together with office in, uh, in uh, Uckel. Um, 
Well, you see the resemblance of the house, and so here I planted this tree, and so we looked very much in detail what this tree would be, what 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 it has René Magritte um, painted, and so we came up with the type of tree that it should be, Metasecoga Glyptostroboides. It's a, a cypress uh, of the marshes, which we planted here, and which well today has become much bigger. It's a inversion of the Marit painting, but in a, in a sense, reality starts to imitate the art. Uh, Oscar Wilde would say, life imitate, imitates art far more than art imitates life. And so in a way, we, we're, we're trying to, to produce this. And to, to, today I sat together with Michiel de Klein, who's our house photographer, and I asked him to, to go find this moment and, and try to, to bring, or to make this picture again. So in a kind of, of a circle of reality producing an image that transforms reality that produces an image so that's that's really central to 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 our practice um, <clears throat> another uh, reference is the the, the arboretum in Tervuren, when we were asked to make a buffer zone in between uh, the freeway around uh, merxen um, and the, 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 the residential area um, we came up with a kind of we call it a buffer arboretum and I wanted to put this image in there because it looks so much like the image you just showed of the hunters in the snow. Um, this is Michiel Kleene photographing um, our project. Where the Rupesoir is very much present, even if we didn't know what that really meant. Um, I'll show you some more uh, ongoing projects. Uh, recently we were asked to make um, the landscape of a, um, of a, a house or a villa, I should say, in Beverly Hills um, in Los Angeles. And so we were looking at images that could be inspiring. This, of course, is David Hockney, a bigger splash. Um, and so in the office, um, we looked at all types of vegetation Hockney would use in his LA uh, projects. And we made a scheme, it's ongoing, but only using trees from the paintings of Hockney. Um, and so in that sense, also only choosing trees that Hockney had seen, so in a kind of play of what did Hockney um, remain, or what, 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 what for Hockney was special about LA, and can we make a garden based on Hockney's view of LA. And, and even more recently, we've been doing this with um, Le Douanier, Rousseau. Um, we're doing a project in the south of Colombia, in the Amazonian rainforest. And here again, um, we looked at all the plants that Rousseau would have painted, and we actually made a painting a la Rousseau, if you like. This is a true Rousseau. It's only vegetation from Rousseau. Um, but so we're looking at what kind of vegetation did he use, what did he see, and how can we bring that back into play, and, and why. It's not only a kind of gimmick, but it's also this idea of making the Amazonian rainforest comprehensible for us Westerners. So we're, in a way, because Rousseau, the, the big story is that Rousseau never went to the, the rainforest, but he painted from botanical gardens. So he would go to the Parisian botanical gardens, paint all that vegetation and compose an image. So he made a kind of imaginary landscape of real plants and we're trying to make a real landscape from an imaginary painting. So it's this idea of revealing the existing through a process of art that then produces a new reality. And I have many <laughs> because we like this kind of um, this kind of dialectic. This is Munch um, and then also Last year we started working on the memorial for the, the, the attacks in Utøya, um, on an island that resembles this island uh, shown by, by, by Munch, it could be Utøya. Um, here you see the, the, the actual island. And I remember the first time when I went visiting the site last April, um, one year ago, at some point I was really struck because I saw this. This is of course Kaspar Friedrich, but this was my my colleague that's working with me, and I was like, wow, this is, we are in Kaspar Friedrich. So it, it's interesting that it doesn't produce a project yet, but it produces a kind of feeling. And, and, and again, I would quote uh, Oscar Wilde, who would say that it's, it's only through a painting or a photograph or a, something made, something, an artifact, that you can actually see something. And so I, I could only see this, of course, thanks to Kaspar Friedrich. Um, and from this I, I go to maybe the, the, the kind of most, um, or the wildest project we've done, together with artist Philippe Parreno, who said, I want to make a movie about a landscape of a planet lit by two suns, 
which is called by the NASA the continuously habitable zone, so the movie is called CHZ, and so where we try to imagine what kind of landscape would be produced by these two suns. In NASA literature they said that because of the, the, the there would be more frequencies, so all the plants would be black, so they could capture more sunlight and more different frequencies to produce more photosynthesis. And so we made this black landscapes uh, together with, uh, with Philippe um, in Portugal to produce this, uh, this movie. So it, it's always this, this idea of, of a landscape being made with, 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 um, with real plants, with real stuff, but also always referring to an, 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 an image. <coughs> I have some more, but I wonder if we should not already do a little discussion before I show you um, the next one. That's what really uh, intrigues me and, and, and is part of my, my interest, and, and we talked about this uh, uh, last week, is that you so consciously use art and, and works of art and images as a, a, a starting point, as a kind of a basic idea to reconstruct, uh, uh, to make and shape a landscape, and a landscape becomes reality. And, and effectively, um, you are using the, the the same kind of methods as, as Bruegel is taking rea reality or taking parts of reality, taking images, taking them apart and combining them to create a new image, which in its turn becomes a new re reality. And, and this really fascinates me to see that, that, that imaging and images and paintings uh, become the starting point of a new re reality. That is what we talked about. about uh, reality and perception in, in landscape, and is this something you have been doing I mean, you, when you start off in landscape art? Is this something you've been always been doing, or is this something which slowly came into your working process as a landscape ar architect? I think from the beginning, what we tried to do was to um, dissect reality into different layers. And we would call it the, the, the there's like six main layers mm -hmm. vegetation topography hydrography the parcels the built environment the infrastructure loaded by heart because those are the kind of six layers that you can always read a landscape from and that would be an aerial photograph which we would dissect those elements to understand the interaction between these six um, elementary compositions uh, or, or, or comp compositional elements of, of, of a landscape and it's in the combination that a real landscape emerges so 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 at some point the, the analysis by itself is a bit cold when you start looking at paintings you understand that the painter is already revealing something that he has seen in the landscape so in a certain sense the, the, the those paintings help us understand how a landscape works and, and in that sense for me uh, um, through art art reveals something unseen so, so so in a sense we understood that looking at those paintings that really helped us and, and we understood how, how these landscape painters were actually landscape architects in a certain sense because they understood how the landscape is made they, they could see through it and so so I think in a kind of um, I, would, I should go back to when, when would be the first time that we used a, a painting but in the beginning we didn't use painting it was more the, the, our reading trying to combine things on our on our own and, and, and more and more we've been looking now at, at paintings and, and today for example we, we made a, um, a new image for a project in Arle and so, so in the office I asked them like, look, look at the most um, important paintings of Van Gogh in Arle take do that color code and let's make, the, 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 let's make all our images based on that color mm -hmm. code so we bring and it's not uh, gratuitous because it's of course bringing the colors that Van Gogh saw in Arle back on the plan so it's it's using, um, using in a way what the artist uh, has deciphered for us as, as, as information in the project. I find this very interesting because um, this really is how it worked in the 15th and 16th century as well. For a long time, uh, landscape art in the 15th and 16th century, which is, is, is always, and rightly so, seen as something which is very typical for, uh, for, for the, the Low Countries. Uh, was, it was a topos already from, from the middle of the 15th century when, when in Italy uh, Van Eyck and Rogier van der Weide were described as, as, as great artists, uh, amongst others, because they could depict 
the world around them so faithfully. So this became a topos, a cliché, as one might say, in the 15th and 16th uh, century. But for a long time, landscape art was seen as something which emerged from landscapes in the background into a so-called pure landscape. And then uh, art historians would discuss would the pure landscape start with Patineer in 1521, when Durer saw his work, and the, for the first time he used the word landscape artist. Was this with Bruegel, or was this later in the 16th century? Whereas now, uh, in, in, in art historians see that this is not really the case. There is no pure landscape. There is no pure landscape art. In the 15th and 16th and 17th century, there were all kinds of illusions. Uh, there were all kinds of, of meanings which were attached to the landscape. So the artists did not look at nature and depict it faithfully as a pure landscape, but they, there were all kinds of layers of meanings, outspoken, intended, sometimes not intended, or so understood by the public, which were loaded into the landscape. And, and, and you can see that in the 16th century, artists really took out elements that they saw around them to recreate a, 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 new, a new landscape. And, and this seems to be the same kind of working process that, that you have, um, partly using nature itself, as you show the pictures of those eroded rocks, partly using works of art. Uh, to, to, to dissect them and then to reassemble them into a new re reality. And I find that this, this parallel process from what you are doing, and I assume other landscape art architects would have, I wouldn't know, uh, with this 16th century view of the landscape, I find this extremely fascinating and helps me as an art historian to better understand the mechanisms in, uh, in, 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 in this period. So we must be extremely old-fashioned if we use 15th century techniques, but I like that idea. Because the, the, where, where I found, um, what I found relevant in, in, in what Burgo does for our work is indeed that he chooses exemplary elements, the, the cliffs, the, the river, the, the, the woodlands, the, the, I mean, there's, there's this kind of archetypal elements that he uses into a kind of, I would say, like, best possible landscape, exemplary landscape I would like to use, because it's a term that we use for our work. The difference being that, that for example, when we look at Brussels, we, we look at all the fragments geographically where they are, and we try to combine them into a nice landscape, or an interesting landscape, or an or a, or a augmented landscape. But of course, Bruegel could use pieces of, that he saw on his trips to Italy, with, with things he saw um, in, in, in Brabant, and so, so he could in a way, because his painting is of course a painting, he, he, he could combine those elements that are geographically not bound, while we would try to do the same thing within the, the one single geography. So in, in that sense, when I understood how Bruegel worked, and really, I needed, I needed to go to Vienna to, to really get into, into his work, I was, I was really struck by that. I, I thought, wow, that, that's indeed very similar to, to what we were trying to do. With a very different outcome, of course. Well, what struck me as well, because we didn't know uh, which pictures we, we would choose, we only saw this uh, about half an hour before <laughs> the talk started, is um, some of the photographs you chose as, a, as a, uh, a, a model for inspiration. For instance, if you, you, you took this scenery of the Alps, which inspired you to, to to set up this, this, this landscape or the park in, in, in La Défense, if I remember correctly. If you look at it, it's, it's exactly the same interest which Bruegel had in the landscape. There's this famous anecdote, which is often repeated in the Bruegel literature, that, that Bruegel was already in his lifetime. People saw that he was fascinated by the landscape around him and, and absorbed all the impressions. And Karel van Mander, uh, who didn't know Bruegel in person, but knew persons and, and friends and colleagues and family members of Bruegel, said that he was so impressed when he went back uh, from Italy to the Low Countries. He was so impressed by the Alps that when he came back home, he, he as it were, spugte them out. He, he spit out uh, those impressions. And, if you look at the photograph, what you use, is, it's, it's exactly the same as the images which Bruegel spat out, um, which again shows me how susceptible uh, Peter Bruegel was for landscape impressions. And the same goes 
I also find this very interesting. You, if you look at the picture, perhaps you could go back of, of, of you took of your colleague here, seen from the back, and you, 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 you rightly uh, combine this with, with the Caspar David Friedrich. But actually, you're looking at much older schemes, and it is Peter Bruegel is one of, of not very first, but uh, using people seen from the back uh, to lead you, because that is what happens here in, in a picture such as this. You are, as an on viewer, you, you associate, if you look at somebody seen from the back, that, that's the kind of psychological mechanism which always works. You can see this in movies, you can see this in photographs from the 19th century, you can see it if you look at the films. By, by Tarkovsky and others, seeing uh, somebody watching a landscape seen from the back, he leads your eye and leads your gaze as an onlooker. You become part, you look with somebody into a landscape. So this is very interesting that you use such photograph because consciously or unconsciously, you, you use mechanisms which go back to the, to the 16th century and which Bruegel in a masterly way uh, used for his landscapes. And when we spoke last Friday, you, you told me that Tarkovsky used Bruegel as an inspiration for, for his films. It would be interesting to, to, to explain us a bit more on, on, on how he, he did that. Yes, what, what is so interesting about Bruegel uh, and about his, his, his landscapes in general and his pictures in general is that they are multi-layered. Um, you, you do not see Bruegel, you do not grasp Bruegel at first glance, but Bruegel really... Uh, stimulates you and using pictorial tricks like the great poussoir, like the river winding its way with people seen from the back pointing to, 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 uh, to other elements in the composition. He really invites you to, to follow uh, a path through the composition. And in this sense, it is very interesting to see that many filmmakers are indeed very much impressed uh, by Bruegel, especially in landscapes. So it is known, he wrote about this, that Tarkovsky was highly influenced, especially uh, as, as you also were with the, the, the return of the hunters, the, the, the famous painting. Um, what was interesting, unfortunately, I was not, was not there uh, at that moment, that, for instance, Wim Wenders uh, came to the Bruegel exhibition, uh, and, and he really had to be carried out, uh, my colleagues told me, uh, after six or seven hours, and he really was struck by the pictorial strategies uh, which Bruegel employed, which leads me, and of course this is a hypothesis and, 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 and a claim which I cannot really I mean, make true, but I would think that if somebody like Bruegel was living now, he would be one of the greatest filmmakers. That's, that's, that's really how Bruegel works. And he takes you into, like you work in a landscape, he takes you into the plains uh, and leads your eye and makes you wander into the entire composition. And that again uh, refers to uh, something which, which I think um, also your work, which, which you showed me Friday, has something which was extremely important in 15th and 16th century. Uh, theory on poetics and art, not only the visual art, but also music, uh, poetry, drama, theater, and that's copia et varietas. Copia is the richness, and varietas is the variety. And that was, if you read the descriptions of Bruegel, but also the descriptions of what people looked at in the 15th, and especially in the 16th century, it was this richness, this abundance, and this variety depicting again uh, everything which God's recreation of heavenly paradise has to offer on earth. That's, that's the way you should understand and look at. But the Scopia Varietas, I've, I, I've, maybe you're not aware of the term, but I find this fascinating also in the work which you do and the way you treat landscape and try to create new landscape. So on, on this term, I would like to share with you the copia and varietas of Brussels. <laughs> <laughs> and in a couple of slides to show you, um, maybe some of you know, this is the study we made for Brussels 2040, but I want to show this because in, in a way it relates to how Bruegel chooses his kind of um, highlights of his trip to make a, a, an image. We, what we do is we try to choose the highlights of the existing, and this is one of the the satellite photo of Brussels. Um, we are right now here next to the, the Royal Park. 
And what we would do in the office is we would carefully select all the things that we think could be interesting for us, which means, um, for example, permeable areas from football fields to forests to royal parks to the, the Sonin forest. So, so this is a kind of mapping that we would do and we would carefully cut out all the, 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 um, the interesting elements that, that could make up a landscape. And then we would look for a kind of um, rule or a kind of um, systemic value that would combine all these elements. And when we made this map, I just made, made it a long time ago, 2010, I think, I was struck by the fact that there, was, there didn't seem to be any natural logic behind these fragments, which made them um, fragile, um, easily eaten up by any type of pressure from any type of development. So, so it was only when we were zooming out and trying to understand how the landscape worked that we understood that they are actually bound by tributaries, by secondary rivers, that would flow all these beken in Nederland, the Maalbeek, Molenbeek, Neerpedebeek, Sint Gelijtsbeek. We have eight of those, um, uh, those, those tributaries, as, as they're called in English. And if you project them on this image, you see that 80% of the greenery is directly linked to those tributaries. So in a way, where Bruegel could, of course, make his kind of um, sampling um, from what he had seen, we're obliged to make a sampling on the terrain, within, within the frame. But this helps us to understand reality in a different way. It made us understand that Tour Taxis can be seen as a branch of the, the Molenbeek, and, and this helped us to imagine how um, this system of tributaries could develop, and how they, they, they could suddenly become a way of imagining a new reality. And for example, for Tour Taxis, we imagined the old um, train uh, road, the train, the, the rail yard, um, as a tributary, and, and, and that's the force of an image, so we've built it accordingly. And so today it looks like a tributary, which it never was. Um, yes, I, I, I find this, this really very, very intriguing, because if you look here at the landscape which you and, 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 and your colleagues created, but also look at the way in which uh, the photographer framed this, you are actually looking at a composition by Peter Brogold. So you see uh, the same high point of view. You see the trees as a repoussoir leading. And then you go into the middle plane. And in the middle plane, uh, there is a winding, well, in this case, not a river, but a suggestion of a river connecting the middle plane uh, to the background where, rather vaguely, like the atmospheric, uh, illusions in the paintings by Bruegel, uh, you, you will see uh, 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 an architectural landscape because architecture is, is as much part of a landscape as, as, as nature is. So I was really intrigued by this and, and, and I immediately said, wow, has the photographer been influenced by, by, by Bruegel? But even if not, it, it, it shows how much the way we now look at nature has been formed by the images uh, of, of centuries of, of, of landscape art. So landscape art forms our perception of landscape and that in turn recreates landscapes and creates a new reality. And I think this is something which is highly fascinating and, and, and makes me understand 16th century landscape art much better. Absolutely, and, and I did ask Michiel Leclerc, who's a photographer of this beautiful picture, if he knew he was making a Bruegel, he said no. And he was very charmed by the fact that I said that Manfred Selling thought it looked like a Bruegel. He's like, oh, okay. But it, it totally proves your point that, that he has been influenced by the art of Bruegel, even unconsciously, and is reproducing an image that Bruegel would have made. Yes. So who would have thought that Turman Taxis would be <laughs> transformed into a Bruegelian landscape? <laughs> Another, and this is more kind of a, a game um, for us, because we can be as blasphemous as we want to be, since we're not um, landscape theorists. So when, when, when looking at this image, we were trying to, to understand what happens, and in the office we found out that actually two-thirds look like a landscape that could be anywhere in, in Flanders, in Brabant, uh, those typical houses 
kind of undulating landscape, a river, the, 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 the snow. I mean, this, this, could be, this could be easily somewhere in, uh, in, in Belgium. And then you see that he, he added one third, and it's exactly one third, of the snowy peaks that, of course, do not exist in the low countries. And, and, and as a game, we looked at another uh, image, um, the gloomy day, somber dag, where here again, two thirds could be somewhere um, not far from here, uh, people cutting those willows, um, the, typical, the typical hatched roofs, and then again, one third of exoticism, <laughs> if you want, snowy peaks and that he had seen on his travels to, uh, to, uh, to Italy. So, so it, it's not a theory, of course, but it was, it was interesting to see that, that, that he really combines these landscapes with these typical, typical images. And I have some more um, to, to, yeah, to come to the point that it, this is, it's a bit by accident that we started doing this. It's not that we um, were not specialized in, in dissecting um, paintings from the 16th century. Um, but when, um, for Dilbeek, the Blick van Bruegel, uh, we were asked to make one of the 15 interventions. Um, I, I remember I was very, very struck when, when, uh, when uh, Katrien uh, showed the, 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 the triumph of death. And, and, and suddenly I was interested in this kind of vertical elements and, and looking at, um, at these different paintings, we understood what you, what, what you um, uh, explained so well, this, this, this repoussoir, this idea that, that the trees are in the front and create create the background by putting them in the front, which seems contradictory in, in a certain sense. And, and they can be a bit open as here, they can be right in the middle, this is a gloomy day, they can be on either side, this is a return of the herd, they can be a bit scattered, here is less of a, of a repoussoir, um, this is a, the, the census, this is, a, is, a, is a, the, the, the Christ, and here what we were struck by is that there's trees, but there's also these gallows, and as you may know, um, the punished <laughs> would be would be struck with eight blows and and half dead or at least dying. They would be put up on those poles for everybody to see, and what happens to you if you don't follow the rules? And then the the, the birds would eat up the eyes first. I mean, it's, uh, we've seen this <laughs> looking at those pictures when we made this project. It's very um, detailed. Um, <laughs> but but still, we, we, we were really struck by this um, this very graphic elements, um, and and so what, to show you the process. And this is the this is the image or the the, the, the picture that we then um, very carefully cut out all these vertical elements. And here, for me, and, and this was a kind of a hypothesis that, that we like to to say that from the hunters, where everything is very happy, you know, not the hunters are not very happy because. But at least the trees, <laughs> um, the pre trees are kind of symbol of life because there's birds uh, sitting on them. You hear them almost sing. There's birds flying away. To this image, where 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 actually I can show you, the the, the skeletons are cutting the last uh, living trees. There's not one living tree uh, upright. There's two dead trees, and then all those those gallows, those 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 wheels, um, all these terrible instruments. And in a way, we thought maybe since there's no more trees, the, the, the gallows, the dead wood, is the kind of symbolical inversion of the living trees. So from living trees to dead wood, from trees as a symbol of life, to the gallows as a, a, a method for death. And, and so we decided to, to, to build four of those gallows in Lillebeek. We found a, um, um, what do you call it, Skywerker? Carpenter. carpenter, thank you. A carpenter, uh, um, third generation carpenter, working with the grandfather, the father and the sons, um, as if they had been carpenters since the 15th century, that's what we like to tell ourselves. <laughs> and so we, we went, uh, together with Elise, we went to them and we ordered four uh, wheels, but in the medieval way. So we said no screws, no, 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 no nails, really, um, as you can see, it's, it's full wood, it's, it's, uh, it's built as if uh, ordered in the in the in the 15th or, or, or 16th century, it was then burned or charred to protect it, but also to make it look more like the, the paintings um, of Bruegel, and they were installed on a topography resembling the topography. So we're really 
trying to inverse the, 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 the perception reality cycle. So from, we, we, we thought if Bruegel works with fragments, let's make a fragment that he could have seen and that he could have painted um, on the triumph of death. And so we, we, we tell, we, we told him, no, no, this one a bit more to the left, this one a bit more to the right. So as you can see, not, not one of them is straight, which really confused the carpenter. Um, <laughs> But this, because he would say, like, is this uh, slanted enough? Like, no, a bit more. Um, and so they, they, they become part of the kind of um, contemporary um, vertical elements, which I, which I like. I, I just hope for a bird to sit on them, because then the circle is round. Because um, Karl van Mander would say about this, or about Triumph of Death, he wrote, um, as Catherine. Uh, um, Now we have to correct this. The, the Desk Ryan and the Raven As um, was written by somebody underneath the painting, which we like. To, of course, the, 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 the corpses become, um, uh, or, yeah, becomes food for the, for the birds. But we would like the birds to come back, so we, we uh, um, planted a, a vegetation underneath those gallows that, that supposedly um, the birds could uh, eat from. Again, I find this, this very intriguing because here you can see the same as with the, um, the landscapes of Bruegel, how important rhythm is. So I said the Copiat Varietas is, is one of the defining elements uh, in, 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 in the aesthetics and, and, theory, and theory, art theory in the 16th century. The other important thing also for the landscape is rhythm, repetition and rhythm defining either a musical structure or a landscape. And you can see this beautifully done here, uh, how these four large structures uh, the, uh, give a new dimension to the landscape. And that's the same way in Bruegel, in which Bruegel played. But I, what I also find very interesting is that the way you, you dissect and leave out uh, all, all elements, excluding the trees uh, in, in the Bruegel painting, um, because um, I, I really could use those, those those images for my lectures when talking on pictorial strategy. I've never thought of it. Uh, because there you can see how important uh, the trees and, and the vertical structures are in, in defining what the landscape has to offer and how we perceive a Bruegel landscape. Um, so this proves to me one more time is that we, as art historians and historians, can learn so much about teaming up with completely different um, uh, fields and, 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 uh, and, and look how, uh, in this case, a landscape architect uses mechanisms and uses strategies and, and, and analyzes a landscape, uh, helping us to, to look with fresh eyes at the landscapes which were produced in the 15th century. And this is as a kind of circle, you, the 15th, 16th century makes you aware of certain elements and for you creates new, new visions and your study, your analysis and your decoding of the, these pictures gives us new and fresh insights. I think this is, uh, for me at least, a surprising outcome of the, 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 the discussions uh, which we have. And, and one could ask um, why the 15th and 16th century? But then my response would be because then the landscape was invented. Yes, that's what we talked about as well, is that why in a, uh, as is often said, there is really no landscape uh, in, 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 the, in the Low Countries. And of course, this is completely untrue, because if there's one place in Europe where a landscape was created by men, it's uh, this part of Europe uh, uh, where all landscape already in the 13th, 14th, or 15th century was, was a creation, a deliberate creation, mostly for economic purposes, but that's something else. So. I, I think it, it's exactly here, uh, and this is something which we discuss. It, it, it's exactly here that the landscape, as, as a, a form of art, could um, could only uh, start a, as a new genre because it was here that the landscape was created by man and then recreated uh, in, in in painting and in art. I think we can conclude on that and then give the. Mike to the audience if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Oh.
when I first saw your pictures on, on the, the trees of Brugge, let's call it like that, I immediately uh, thought about Valerius the Sadler. Do you know why? Is it just because the trees are also black? Or is there another reason, composition in the region? I'll leave the word to the expert. Um, it, it, it's very interesting that you point this out because uh, it was a generation of artists uh, who after 1902 became extremely influenced by Peter Bruegel. Why 1902? Then was this large exhibition, Le Primitif Flamand, uh, a famous exhibition which was about 15th and 16th century art because in the 19th and early 20th century Bruegel was seen as, as the culmination of the, the long period of the Flemish primitives. It was not seen as in the light of the later development, which is the end of something which started. Um, and what you see with Valerius de Sadeler is that he was uh, enormously struck, uh, especially by the, 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 the panels, uh, which were not in, 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 not on show anyway in 1902, but had seen copies and photographs, uh, by the panels of the seasons, which, and then especially by the winter landscape. Uh, the return of the hunter. So what you see with Falari is this other layer and why this, this is so profoundly similar to the, your, uh, your dissecting is, is the, the contrast between the trees and the whiteness because uh, Sadeler often used the, 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 the elements of Bruegel landscapes in winter landscapes and those are the most profound and the strongest images. So that, that is why it makes you think because they're winter landscapes and they're the contrast between the whiteness of the snow and uh, the trees is, is so enormous. But it's the same thought that occurred to me when I first saw uh, uh, your analysis and decoding, is that, wow, this looks like uh, the Sadler revisited. And I want to say one word on the winter landscapes, especially for Paul, because he, he likes to always find relationships between everything. The, the... Paul, this is for you. <laughs> The, the winter landscapes in Bruegel, according to latest scientist uh, discovery, would be linked to the, the, um, the genocide that happened in the New World. So the, 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 the Spanish coming to the, 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 the New World, um, the, the Spanish colonies, um, um, well, the, 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 the whole indigenous population was totally decimated. So um, the, the, there was a, a lot less... Um, use of a, of a, I'm just trying to remember it well, to tell you this well, so the, 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 the whole world population was, 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 was um, reduced by 10 or 15 percent because of the, the, the diseases that they brought with them, which created um, a drop in temperature. And that drop in temperature occurred in the 1520s, 30s, a bit later maybe, that made a kind of dip in temperature in um, the lowlands, the low countries, that uh, uh, produced this this uh, this moment where there's those winter landscapes. Well, so it's slightly later, and it, it's debatable according to specialists whether this was the reason. But it is a fact that what we call the small ice age, the, the, the Kleine Eiszeit, started around 1550, 1560, with uh, and probably an, a, a drop of temperature of uh, between one and a half and two and a half degrees with enormous influence. So we know from descriptions, anyone who wants to know more about this, Philippe Lom, who is an Austrian, part, an Austrian partly Netherlands uh, author who wrote a beautiful and very stimulating book on the Kleine Eisenheit. Um, and, and if you read records, because they didn't have, they didn't follow the temperature with a lot of descriptions. So from the 1550s onwards, we know, for instance, that the Schelde froze over and, and, and the winters became longer, colder, and there was more snow. So it was effectively a, a reality. And this is, this is partly why Bruegel, indeed, uh, can be seen as, as the start of the, the winter landscape, a tradition which was extremely popular, first in the southern Netherlands, later in the, in, 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 in the Dutch Republic in the north, and was enormously popular until the beginning of the 18th century. So that is true that it was also a, a um, becoming a, a reality, this, this cold, the cold winters, the cold long winters, yes. A question for both. Um, was, there, was there something that you wanted to prove with the experiment 
of the Brugge trees? Or was it a co coincidence that you came on such, such beautiful uh, results? No, it, it was really, um, I remember in, in the, the, the church in, um, in, uh, in Dilbeek, um, when, when, when you showed the, say, Katri Lichtert, because she was really an important inspiration, when you showed the, the triumph of death, I was like, I don't know, I, I knew I wanted to make those gallows, I don't know why, um, but, uh, well, they're there. Um, and, be, you know, of course, in, to be able to make them, we needed to know how, how Bruegel made them, because at some point, we had, we had to decide, I mean, the, the, the carpenter asked us, like, how high are they, how wide are they, we're like, um, we don't know, we only have a painting, so we, we had to reproduce the painting to understand how they were built, what was the scale, and, and, and so basically, um, we started with that painting, just like um, yeah. cutting them out to see how, how they were made. And then, yeah, there was this, this, this kind of intuition that you, there was something struck with these um, vertical elements. Um, and, and there was a bit of time in the office too, I remember, because some of the people here have been clicking uh, away on Photoshop to, to, uh, to, to clean them up. And so suddenly we, we started, yeah, Playing with it with the other with the other um, images, and we went, and then we suddenly found this 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 kind of um, intriguing importance of the vertical elements, and then by accident I remember I, I was in uh, Vienna because like we went, I, I flew over just to go see the exhibition, and then we were in the airport, and the plane was delayed for two hours, so with Sophie were just kind of chatting away, and then I, I showed you what we were doing, and she was like, ah, oh, this is so interesting, we should show this in Bosa. I was like, oh, well, it was never intended to be shown, but then we. We we we, yeah, we 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 made it. It became a project on itself. So, but it was never we didn't, we you no. Know, we as as most discoveries, you discover something while you're looking for something else. So we were just looking for the measures of the gallows to be able to reproduce them. <clears throat> to finish the discussion about the little ice age, if you come from the physics side you look up the term more on the minimum because actually it's related to the solar activity and uh, solar physicists are going back with the 11 year cycle of the solar activity and looking exactly when these paintings were made to prove or disprove some of their assumptions. But I have a more practical question because you very much are working as a team as I understand which I find very nice that somebody is not putting himself in the front but how does this work out in practice? Are you having a kind of a way day where you go and see some exhibitions and you come back and exchange your views? Are you going to a library and then everybody's picking randomly up a book? Because it's difficult to have a creative process where you go to so many different sources as you've shown before. <laughs> um, no, we, we, we work a lot. Um, but I actually should ask them because uh, <laughs> I'm probably going to say some, something vaguely true. Um, but for, for example, in, in, in this particular case, we, we, I think there's a lot of um, space for, for, for things to be um, explored in the office. So, so people are not just doing what I tell them to do, but they're trying to explore and, and, and work with me through the process. And in this case, um, it would, for example, not one image was done by, by one person. Many persons would work on it also to have different views on it, because you have to make a selection which, which tree is a tree finally, because if some trees are kind of hidden by a person, do you take it, do you not take it, we would print, and then we would uh, sketch on it, so it really became a project where we sketch like, ah, this tree, try it without this tree, ah, this shrub, maybe you should, the shrub should be a bit lighter, maybe, so it's, it's not just, um, it's not just something a computer could do, it's really um, informed uh, uh, decision making about how, how to make it, so we would make different options, we would discuss them, as we would do with the project, we, 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 did, we, we it was not very, um, uh, yeah, it was not very dissimilar from, from making a project. And then, of course, the, the, in, in, in the office, I, I mean, uh, um, that's also the reason why most of them are, are here. I, I, I think it's very important to not just work your life away, but to have the time to see things and to, to discover things. So I think that's, that's, it. And that's, that's all. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a, of a kind of stupid creator that I would um, keep in the offices. You cannot be unhappy. Um, and, and bored and, and frustrated when you make public spaces where you want people to have a good time. I mean, if you're not having a good time designing it, nobody will have a good time building it and nobody will have a good time enjoying it. So, it, so you, I mean, I think it's important that this kind of, um, yeah, that, that there's a kind of, 
there needs to be conviction and passion, but also a kind of a joy about the, the making public spaces or, or, or parks. I hope, guys. <laughs> No more questions? Okay, I think that we can wrap up. I wanted to thank you very much, and I'm so happy, Mas, that I ran into you in the exhibition in Vienna, and that our plane got delayed, and that Manfred accepted also to have this, this talk, because I think it was really inspiring, and I, I think there are still a lot of questions that will pop up. But um, yeah, well, thank you so much for this, uh, for this conversation.